Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. Dear friend and guest co-host today, because we're going to talk about something that necessarily is not our our field of expertise, but we're very passionate about. Let's let's put it that way. Angela McHouston is with us here in the studio from Music Strong. We've had her on the show a couple of times. Angela, welcome to the show. Hi, Bob. Thanks to be here. Thanks to be here. That's not a Thanks thing. to be here. <laughs> to be here. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. I like that. Do you want to try it? you want to try it again? Just, just for the heck of it? I don't care. No, <laughs> let's leave it. That's funny. <laughs> Whatever. It's, it's nice to be here, too. Indeed. We're talking about something. It, it's, it's definitely been something I've been very passionate about for a long time. And then you posted something on Facebook a few months ago, I think it was, and I responded to it, and you and I started having some conversation. We both realized mm. we feel the exact same way about this, and that is pay to play, which really hasn't raised its ugly head here in Nashville too much. Now, I'm from Southern California originally, and we had some venues out there, especially in Hollywood, that they were part of that pay-to-play scenario. We had Gazzari's, which was a rock and roll club, the Whiskey, a go-go, which has been around for a long time. And what they would do is they would set up to where they would give you a block of tickets Mm -hmm. and whatever that number was. It was 25 or 50 or 100 tickets. And there was so much face value to those. And you as the artist or the band had to go out and sell that many tickets or you had to write a check at the, at the end of the day, whichever came first. So it, it prompted you to go out and sell the tickets. to And I, and I get why they were trying to do that. Mm-hmm. No club owner, no venue operator wants to have an empty house when a band no. is performing. Now, the whiskey is very unique in that that is where acts such as The Doors, Jim mm-hmm. Morrison and The Doors performed. Chicago played there, several, several major acts. That's where they got their start. And I don't think that was a pay-to-play situation. But I've been with some acts, I've been with some artists that have played both of those clubs I've mentioned, which is Gazzari's and, and the Whiskey. And it's been a, pay-to-pay, it's been a pay-to-play proposition for them to get on stage. Let's talk about this Nashville scenario, which w- really wasn't so much a pay-to-play but it was a very unique, let's say, quote unquote, opportunity for artists that just didn't make sense. Yeah. And I feel like it's kind of morphed into a, a big, ugly monster at this point, like with no end in sight is kind of where we are. From, yeah. From what I'm hearing, because, you know, that's not my scene. I'm a classical musician, so I'm not I'm not on, the, uh, on Broadway playing those venues. But for my friends who play those venues, what I hear is the same thing over and over again. Like we're just... We have, we have artists who show up and they're playing for tips and they're playing four hour sets with one break, maybe two, four hours for tips. And this is on lower Broadway. This is on lower Broadway. And they'll do two, three, sometimes four of these in one day. Sets. Sets. Yeah. Which boggles my mind that this is okay. And from, from the people I've talked to. What I hear is a lot of times people will use this to fill the space between when they're going out on the road with other bands and then they just come back and, you know, they they fill in and they play and they play all over the place. But then they go out on the road with somebody else. So it's it's not a full time gig. But for the people who are just starting here, it's this whole thing of this is how, quote unquote, they think this is how I make it. Someone's going to come discover me here. I don't think anybody from anywhere is coming to discover anyone on Broadway. Could, I, I could be wrong, but not really thinking that's it, because the level of talent down there is so high. Do you really go there to discover people? Yeah, you know, so going back to my label days, mm-hmm. when I worked at the record label or, or various record labels, we didn't go on lower Broadway. Of course, 
lower Broadway back then was a lot different than this <laughs> now. Different scene back then. Um, we we didn't have the bachelorette parties. We didn't have the wild, crazy Las Vegas strip type vibe that that lower Broadway has now. And some people like that. Some people don't. But back in the label days, we went to showcases. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say a showcase, an an artist or an act would maybe book a room at at one of the rehearsal studios. Might be Soundcheck or it might be SIR, Studio Instrument Rentals, one of those types of venues. Or they'd run a club. They'd rent out a club for the evening. And it would kind of be like a, you know, a no-host bar. It would be... Or maybe I should say it'd be an open bar and they'd bring in food and they would entertain prospective, whatever, label people, managers, agents, uh, promoters. They would bring them in Mm -hmm. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, bada bing, bada boom. They're done. Mm -hmm. But I don't think in this world, those A&R guys or those artist development people, I don't think they go to Broadway. Now, with that being said, and we're talking just about Nashville, there's other markets out there that I've actually worked in, like Austin, Austin, Mm -hmm. Texas, Boston, Mm -hmm. Massachusetts, Chicago, Illinois, Orlando, Florida. And I'd love to hear from some of our listeners what they think, but I don't think that game is played in any other market domestically, and I have no idea what it's like in the world. Now, I will preface that by saying we had an artist on the show a couple months ago from Australia who talked about busking. She mm. would go out and stand in front of merchants and play for tips. And right, for free. right. But that's something totally different. That's like a 15, 20, maybe 30 minute. You're talking these people play for hours, hours upon hours. Hours. And they're in a band. They're not, this is not a solo gig. And we have that on Lower Broadway as well. I mean, I can, I can think of all kinds of people who do that same thing, which I think is great. Um, and it kind of adds to the ambiance and the, the charm of it. And uh, it, it can be kind of fun. But the, the idea that you are a professional musician, you are an artist, you are, this is not your hobby. You're trying to make a living out of this and you're playing for tips. Uh, or paying to play. Or paying to play. Yeah. I, that boggles my mind. So to get to your point about what I posted on Facebook. Yeah, let's, I, let's talk let's, about that, let's original, get to that. that original scenario that right. started all this. So what it is, is I didn't post this. This was something that came up. Uh, some other person on my feed posted it, and it was uh, an ad from Kendra Scott and their new location on Broadway and Fifth. And what it basically said uh, was, and this is just in a nutshell, we cannot pay you. We want you to play for an hour and a half. We, quote, cannot pay you, and they gave reasons why that made no sense, Uh, but we'll give you a piece of jewelry. Also, you cannot ask for tips and you cannot play original music. Um, I don't know how many red flags that set off in your brain, but my brain just went insane. And I thought that's got to be the most disrespectful thing I've ever heard from a billion dollar company. You can't as a consumer. I forget what they called themselves, but it's like that. So so do your metallurgists and your silversmiths play, you know, work for a diamond? Does that pay their rent? No, why are we any different? Where do you get off? Yeah. <laughs> just it, it just it made my blood boil. Like, why do you think we're such second class citizens that you can say that and that's OK? And they got such backlash that by the time I had posted it, they had already taken it down. But it's still going out there, which I think it should, because from the canned response that I got on both of my platforms and other people, they're, they're saying the same thing everywhere, basically says, Um, it it says that, oh, we, we pay a mutually agreed upon blah, blah, blah pay, meaning, uh, we could barter. That's not it. No, no. Basically what they're saying is, oh, bummer. We got caught. Hmm. Okay. So the point of the matter is that these companies think, and I have no problem with companies, but the fact that you can solicit people's hard work, talent, and time. And we're not just talking the hour and a half. How long does it take you to fi- like to fine tune those skills? How many hours? How many decades? Okay. How long did it take you to drive there and back? What is parking in Nashville? 50 bucks an hour? 
Just well, parking. it's not that bad, but yeah, yeah I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I've seen anywhere someplace. from ten to twenty bucks or more to yeah. park. Yeah, right. And so, uh, your little piece of rinky-dink jewelry that we may or may not even want—we don't even know who you are. We could care less. But then you have copyright infringement. Did you get the rights? And we talked about that too because we did. The majority of the clubs, the majority of the venues in any market. Yeah. We're just going to focus on Nashville because mm-hmm. that's where we're based out of. They pay their annual fee to BMI or ASCAP or right. CSAC or all of the above to cover that blanket policy for music that's being played. So there's not a copyright infringement issue. Right. Right. I'm pretty sure they've not paid anything. But it sounds like they've gotten away with this before and this is the first time they got caught. It's kind of like the article that came out this past weekend about Chick-fil-A, instead of paying their employees, was going to give them food. And they call it volunteer workers. And I love Chick-fil-A. I mean, I can wolf wolf down a number one pretty quick fashion. (laughs) And I love Chick-fil-A. I really love what they stand for. I, I love the store. I love the food. I love the people. But that one kind of bit them in the butt. Too. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, and and they literally had to kind of backstep on that. Right. I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter who the retailer is, and we're not here to pick on one in particular. No. But I think, first of all, I think any artist that is out there trying to make a name for themselves, and, and, and what is the rule of thumb these days? 10,000 hours before you master your craft, something like that is what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Malcolm Gladwell says that anyway in his book. Yeah, and, and I think that's pretty much the norm, and I'm only 9,900 and some odd hours away <gasps> from- You're almost there. Almost. 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 Um, <laughs> at least in the podcast world. But I think that when an artist gets out there, to try and make a name for themselves. And, and, and let's take a step back even further. Why are you doing that? Why are, why are you playing on Lower Broadway? Why are you playing different clubs around whatever city you're in? Yeah. Insert name of city here. Exposure. That's part of it. But exposure does not pay. You see it's these cartoons the all the time of, you know, Gee, I'm, I'm glad we'll finally get some money after all this exposure kind of tongue in cheek <laughs> uh, that doesn't happen. So, but they're doing it for exposure. They're doing it for learning opportunity. But that doesn't pay the bills. That doesn't put the gas in the car, let alone pay for the parking spot that you have to have while you're at the venue. Doesn't pay for the strings on your instruments. Um, doesn't pay for the lessons you've taken. Doesn't pay for all of that time. And that's... There's a value there. There's a worth. And I think that's what a lot of these artists are going to understand. Yeah, there's there's so much to unpack there. And it, it it's hard to kind of boil it down into cut and dried. This is the answer. This is the problem. Bada bing, bada boom. Right. It's it's hard to do that. But have you seen the commercial or not the commercial, the, uh, the cartoon, basically? Well, maybe it's not a cartoon. Maybe it's just what somebody said in response to. The exposure bit you were just talking about, Mm -hmm. where people say, well, you know, you're going to get great exposure out of this. Well, exposure doesn't pay the bills. Well, instead of where people have taken, um, I wish I had an example with me right now, but where people have taken the job opportunity and they've flipped it around on somebody else. Right. But I mean, I think it's brilliant, you know, like where you're talking to a... A baker or a caterer. A baker or the or, venue. Or, right. Right. Well, we would love, we're going to bring in 500 of our closest friends. We can't pay to use your space, but you're going to get such great exposure. We're going to post it on our social media, but we're not going to pay you. And we're going to bring in stuff and we're not going to clean it up. You have to do that. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but it's the exact same thing. It is the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take a break, get a word in for a couple of our sponsors, and then when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation because I want to dig a little deeper here with Angela McHouston from Music Strong. When you have a cord synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth. Cord gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. 
Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Back in the studio, Angela McHouston is sitting across the podcast table. Welcome back. Happy to be back. Happy to be back. <laughs> <laughs> she had to think about that one for a moment. <laughs> We talk about exposure in exchange of financial remuneration. What is the worth of that particular artist? I mean, how do you come up with a value? Because you talk about a lot of these artists playing for tips. And from what I understand, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute. From what I understand, some of those artists make pretty decent money. Mm hmm down on Lower Broadway. Yeah. But my gosh, 8, 10, 12 hours a day sometimes with musicians you don't know. Boy, you talk about honing your chops and, you know, your skills and learning songs. A lot of these artists are playing, they're playing on the fly. And, yeah. You know, it's just they're, they've got their little iPad or their iPhone and, you know, they've got the chord charts on there or the Nashville numbering system, whatever it is that they use. But at one point, what point do you come up with a market value that seems to be fair and equitable? Now, I know that when I know that when I go on the road as a road manager, or when I went on the road as a road manager, let me put it this way. When I went on the road as a road manager, I had a value. Mm -hmm. There was a certain market value that I charged that I felt I was worth, and that's what it was. Now, if you couldn't afford that, I'll recommend somebody that I think can do the job for the amount of money you're willing to pay. Right. Artists are the same way. If you're a musician, and I use the word artist, but it that transcribes into pretty much anybody we're talking about here. There's a value there. How do we determine what that value is? Well, let me ask you this. When you're determining your value as a road manager uh, or as an artist, where did that value come from? Well, I think after a while, you, you, know what your, you know what your nut is every mm -hmm. month, what your overhead, your bills are, your rent, and your utilities, and, and all that good stuff. And you know that you're going to be on the road for X number of days or weeks or months. And right. so you kind of have to figure it out, okay, this is what I'm worth, and I'd like to put a little money in the bank. I'm not mm -hmm. looking to get rich quick. I'm just, you know, be nice to have a little bit of a cushion because guess what? At the end of that run, days, weeks, or months, how long is it going to be before you get back to work again? Right. Okay. Right. So it's not up to whoever's hiring you to cover that downtime. Now, some entertainers in the world do that. A buddy of mine who was Billy Joel's tour manager yeah. was on retainer whether Billy toured or not. And that, nice. that was a nice gig for him yeah. for a long time. I think that you have, that's how you determine your value, is what, what is it that you're comfortable doing and knowing that when you get off the road, a couple weeks, maybe a month before you get back on the road, either with that same artist or with a different artist, you know, that's the value you have to come up with. That, it's a little more difficult when we're talking about playing at these honky tonks or these bars. It is. And, and that's the tips, you know, are the tips worth it? I, I don't talk to any of these people and, and we've kind of strayed off course a little bit because the whole pay to play type thing or, mm -hmm. or playing for free or quote unquote jewelry. <clears throat> but really when we get down to the gist of it, it is, you've got to determine a value. You have to determine your own worth. What right. is your time worth? Right. How much value do you put on yourself? Well, and it's not just your time. It is yourself. What is your, literally, your self-worth? What is that? Right, right. And so, you know, it's, it's funny. When you think about this, um, okay, so I went to school for flute. So this is different than Broadway musicians who, uh, it, it's interesting that, like, the, the differences in types of musicians that there are. You know, you've got your classical, you've got your rock and roll, you've got your studio, you've got the whole national numbering system. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I, I, that's not even what I do. But when I was going to school, my first gig I think I made 50 bucks. I played at a winery and I was over the moon. I was so excited. I, I was just, I, I don't even know what it's for. I just went out and I had my little book of songs and I took my little, my little stand and I played in the corner and I was all, this is my first gig. I'm professional. You know, right. I was just excited. Right. 
But then as we go through the decades, people want to pay you not much more than that. Okay, that was cool when I was a sophomore in college and it was my first time and I was just learning. But now I've got skills. Now I've got uh, know-how. I've got knowledge. I've put how many hours into getting way better at my instrument, uh, marketing, paying for those marketing products, whether it's a website or business cards or, you know, traveling here and there and whatnot. Um, what's the upkeep on the instrument? What's the insurance on the instrument? What is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So 50 bucks is not going to cover it might it, today it might cover gas, maybe yeah. to the thing and maybe not even back. So, you know, and I see some of this even with with people who pay for private lessons. They haven't changed their rates since the 70s. You know, it's kind of the same thing. Seriously, there are music instructors out there that are still charging what they were charging. Yes. Wow. I know. Oh, yes. And I talked to them. So, I mean, that's a whole nother tangent that I'm happy to get on because I, I felt like I really honed that before I left that field. But don't they realize but they have a, a worth there? No, they don't. And this is this is I think it comes back to that. They don't realize they have worth because they're chasing the dollar and they're chasing the student and they're always going after them thinking they're less than. And they're not. I had a, a teacher that I taught with um, at a school I won't name, but she was telling me about how she would go track down the students. If somebody had to cancel last minute, she'd go into the cafeteria and go find them and be like, you want to come and left have a lesson right now? Like, why are you doing that? And she would charge, I don't know, 15 bucks for a half hour in 2018. I'm like, how do you pay for anything? You can't even pay pay to park to, to teach and I looked at her and said I don't pay I don't I don't have kids pay by the lesson I have them pay by the semester just like a college course I don't care how many lessons they get or don't get and if they show up or don't I get paid right and it just did not compute whatsoever I'm like I do not chase down students period so getting back to our our <laughs> our idea here what is your time worth and what are you worth are you chasing the dollar or should the dollar be chasing you yeah, mm. boy. I like it. <laughs> and there, ladies and gentlemen, is the title of our show of this episode. <laughs> You're right. Should you be chasing the dollar? Should the dollar be chasing you? Because it comes back to what I said. There's a certain amount of self. Right. And I think a lot of times in our industry, and we see it a lot, and you know, I'll broaden that scope a little bit, in the entertainment industry as a whole, there yeah. is a lot of self-confidence issues you know am i worthy enough am i good enough you know well if i don't do it somebody else will and that's part of the plague mm -hmm. not a problem that's part of the plague that we have going on right now is nobody outside of the musicians union is willing to set a price of what well because if i do oh my gosh somebody else will come in and do the gig for me and they'll do it for less. And, and then it. I've lost it. Yeah. That's lack mindset right there, which musicians have a ton of, I think. I don't know. Do you have you seen this? Well, it's we talk about this a lot on the show. It's right brain versus left brain. Yeah. You know, we are either in this industry very creative mm -hmm. or we're very business minded, very analytical. Sure. Very, very rarely are we both. I, and uh, I'm not, you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> why Fair. I'm behind the microphone. Uh, I think that something's got to give at some point, and, and it's almost got to become a unilateral decision that people in the business have got to start saying, I'm worth at least this much, let's start there. Yep. And, it, and it beats tips. Now, this is Nashville. Everybody wants a, a big break in this town. Mm-hmm. And we have a pretty deep pond here, pretty deep pond, that a lot of people want to get into, but it's the cream of the crop that's at the top of that yeah. pond. Yeah. And everybody else, you know, they're struggling to get there. And so Lower Broadway offers that expertise. And, and then also there is, well, if I play on Lower Broadway, somebody who's with so-and-so and they're going to go out on the road is going to see me play and perform and they're going to put me on the road with them. And that can happen. But that doesn't happen every day. No. So at what point does somebody say, I'm worth at least this much and so are you and let's figure out a way to make it happen? We need that. We need that band leader. We need that 
that, you know, we need that individual to get that ball rolling, at least somewhere, somehow. Yeah, you know, I cannot count the number of times just surfing around on Facebook, how many times people have brought up this topic specifically, and it always comes back to, yeah, but someone will take the gig for free. And it started with this post that I made. People say, yeah, but I hope nobody took it. Yeah, but somebody will. Which perpetuates the problem. So it really comes down to more of us than not saying, no, we don't play for free. I mean, we, sure, we'd love to say all of us have to band together. That's not going to happen. All of us who agree and know our worth have to say, no, we don't play for free. And then the people who do play for free, maybe they're not that good and they realize. Maybe slowly, but then they re- then the people who are playing for free also realize, oh, there's this whole bunch of people. Hey, I'm, I don't have to play for free. Maybe this is how we change it. But it has to be enough of us willing to say, no, I, this is my minimum. This is what I charge, period. If you don't like it, I'm in demand somewhere else. I might be booked that day anyway. Sorry. Yeah. We're going to take another break, get a, another word in for another one of our sponsors, because that is what helps pay the bills here mm-hmm. at, the, at this joint. In the studio with us today, Angela McHouston. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook. 101 ways to help you improve your chances of success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Back in the studio, Angela McHouston is sitting across the table from us here at the business side of music podcast studios here in Nashville, Tennessee, or as we love to call them, Music Dog Studio. And if you ever get a chance to look at some of our videos on YouTube, you'll maybe catch a glimpse of our music dog, which is Buddy. Hey, I think he's laying at your feet right now. No, in fact. he is. But he wanders around and, and explores. But yeah, that's Buddy, the music dog here. Um, solutions. And we started to touch base on that, or I should say... You started to touch briefly on that before we yeah. went to the break, but it it's coming up with solutions, not just a solution, but mm-hmm. solutions that kind of fit the thing. I know that when I was playing in my garage band, my high school dance band days, back in, you know, dark ages, we had a set fee of what we would charge to play at the high school dances mm-hmm. or at the wedding receptions or the real estate openings or the bar mitzvahs or the class reunions, whatever the event was. There was a certain amount of money that we agreed. We tried to make it where it was fair and equitable for everybody. But if you have five or six or seven people in your band, which I did, I mean, we had a horn section and a percussionist. Oh, yeah. After a while, you know, 120 bucks doesn't go very far. And and then I discovered that there were acts out there doing exactly what we were doing and getting 10 times the amount. And I said, wow, mm-hmm. how are you doing that? You know, not why are you doing that, but how are you doing that? Because they had set a worth of what they were. Aha. Uh-huh. And I think that's where we've all got to start. Part of my solution is I think everybody needs to start having some dialogue, just as you created yes. on social media. We all need to start having some dialogue and saying, this is, I think, a good starting point. This is what I think I'm worth. And then hopefully from the encouragement with others, mm-hmm. not all, oh, you know, like you said, well, somebody will do the gig for free. We've got to get that mindset out of the way. Yeah. And we've got to start thinking about this is what I'm worth. You get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. And and I think everybody's got to, you know, look, if you're really, really, really good and you're playing on lower Broadway, you're going to probably get a road gig or you're going to probably get studio session work. If you're in Hollywood 
or Austin, Texas, or New York, it's probably the same thing. If you're really, really good, the rest of us have to hone our craft and learn our skills and get that 10,000 hours in. (laughs) Right. But there's still a value there. So I think that's the next step. I think maybe that's the first step. Everybody's got to figure out what that base core value is and go from there. Cost of living, you know, we're dealing with inflation these days, you know, so we can't have that mindset like what you said, the music teachers who were who are still charging what they were charging back in the 70s. That's an antiquated system and it's got to go away. Guys, the 70s was 50 years ago. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Ouch. Appreciate it. But can we can we take a second to digest right. that? Yeah. Yeah. 50 years, not 10, not 30. Yeah. We all think it's 30 years ago, right? <laughs> but that, that brings things into a whole light. You're like, oh, it was the 70s. No, it was 50 years ago. What was gas then? What was your, you could buy a house for what, 50 grand? Yeah, yeah I think gas was 35, 40 cents a gallon back then. Yeah, right. Right, right. So, so I think you're on exactly right. Not that I right. would personally know. But. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, 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 I remember when it hit 84 cents a gallon in my senior year of high school, and I told everybody to like make note of this. It's not going to happen again. Yeah. And it didn't. Yeah. But <laughs> in, the, in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. But I think you're right. Like, why don't I get this in the personal training world too? Nobody wants to disclose their rates. Can we please start telling each other what we charge? Not to just undercut I love each that. other, but can we just start talking about it, please? Yeah. I mean, how are you? People say, well, you got to be competitive. Okay, fine. But how do I know what to charge if no one says what they charge? Am I supposed to just guess and hope I'm close? Well, I mean, let's just talk about it. We had a call for a plumber a few weeks ago to do some work here at the mm-hmm. house. And we called and we we got on social media, we got on Facebook and we said, hey, we're looking for a plumber. Anybody have some some recommendations? And we got we got four or five. We called every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe one did not return phone call, Mm -hmm. but the rest did. Prices were all over the map. Oh, sure. And I think at some point, I think at one point my wife and I went, let's pick the one in the middle. (laughs) <laughs> because the one real cheap might be that way for a reason. Right. And the one real expensive obviously thinks a lot of themselves. Let's go for the one in the middle. There and, you go. and guess what? Great work. No problems. On time. You know, there you go. did it the way they're supposed to do it. But that's what we've got to do in the music business, too. <gasps> we all have to say, you know, paparazzi. It, 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 that was a, a, a we were watching a, a show on paparazzi. Uh, my wife and I were. And the one guy was saying, yeah, you know, I get I get five hundred dollars a shot. You know, if I get like Angelina Jolie or whoever it is, I get five hundred dollars a shot. Yeah. And the other guy goes, man, my minimum for whoever is seven fifty. And the first guy went, yeah, that's my norm, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they kind of feeling each other out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> but that's OK. That's I think we've got to have some we have to have that dialogue to at least get started. Absolutely. And, and figure out what that face value is. Yeah, I mean, if you don't you don't say it, how are you supposed to know? I mean, <laughs> I'm looking around to get my hair done here lately. Right. And uh, most stylists have no problem putting their prices on there. Now, I'm seeing they're mostly within a range, but then I'm going, okay, what's your reviews? Okay, then what's word of mouth? And then I may or may not pick the person who's the most expensive or not. It, it You know, there's... It, it, I think it comes back to that mindset again of, well, someone will always do it cheaper. It has nothing to do with you being cheaper or not. It has to do with how you value yourself and what are you worth and what do you think you're worth. What it, I was in a business course once and they said, okay, what amount of money gets you jazzed to do the work? And if it's less than that, don't you dare do it. Like, that's exactly right. So I just did a two-day workshop, and I priced it at four ninety seven, and then it went full price at nine ninety seven. That's nine hundred ninety seven dollars for two days. And people gave me all kinds of grief. Yeah, five hundred dollar course. Uh, no, thank you. I'm like, well, obviously you're not my person, and your problem isn't bad enough that your career is in jeopardy. You call me when it is right, and it's worth whatever to you. But I wasn't gonna. I was not gonna spend eight hours a day for two days for less than that. Because yeah. it didn't get me jazzed and I felt devalued. And I picked that number out of the air. 
Let's and, try that. And then you really don't want to do it when you have to demean yourself financially. Exactly. Yeah. Musicians can be the exact same way. Let's talk about it, find out what is anybody else charging, and then what gets you jazzed? It's what makes actually going to make you feel good when you start having that conversation. Yeah. 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 What if you find out, like you said, like he was charging seven fifty as opposed to fifty or whatever it was? What if you find out you've been way undercharging and now you can actually charge way more, and that's kind of the norm, and you just didn't know it? Right. How exciting is that? Yeah. I like that idea. I do too. We just got to talk. I agree. Quit being so hush hush. <laughs> and that's what we're doing here today. Exactly. Good. Thank you so much. Anytime.